Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon and good evening for all of you uh, joining us from all over the world. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, the opening ceremony that I have the honor to uh, moderate. My name is Alexandros Makarigakis. I am the science program specialist uh, in UNESCO responsible for the global coordination of water for human settlements. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce the very first speaker for the opening ceremony, Mr. Abu Amani, Director at Interim of the UNESCO Division of Water Science and Secretary at Interim of the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program. Mr. Amani, you have the floor. Merci, merci, Alexandros. Um, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandros. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good evening on behalf of UNESCO and uh, the ADG for Natural and Exact Sciences, Dr. Shamila Nair Bedwell. It is a pleasure for me to welcome you very warmly to this pre conference of the Second International Conference Water, Megacities, and Global Change. I would like to, first of all, thank our dear partners, namely the CIAP, the Greater Paris Metropolis, and ARSO IDF, who are our co organizers as well as our committed sponsors. Eau de Paris and Agence de l'Eau Seine Normandie. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished participants and speakers. Without their presence and contribution, we would not be holding this event. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic uh, UNESCO is organizing with its partners at this conference online, allowing for sharing of experience accessible in the different parts of the world. But we are looking forward to welcoming you in person at UNESCO next year in December. During the second international conference, Water Megacities and global change, Omega 2021, as it's also called. The Omega 2021 conference, together with this pre-conference, are following the path paved successfully back in 2015. Omega 2015, organized uh, in the headquarters of UNESCO during COP21. As you know, during COP21, which arrived at the Paris Agreement. The 2020 World Water Development Report on Water and Climate Change, published by UNESCO on behalf of the UN Water, has clearly showed that by 2050, around 40% of the world population is likely to live in an area experiencing severe water stress and by the same time also, 68% of worldwide population will most probably live in urban agglomeration. The report also highlighted the explicit impact of climate change on the pattern of precipitation, temperature, stress on groundwater, and the frequency of water-related disasters, including drought and floods. The demands of increased population and unsustainable urbanization will further exacerbate the current level of water stress experience in cities worldwide. Together with climate change, these global changes set new requirements of high standard to better manage and plan our water infrastructure and system land use, balance of uses, and governance. In mega cities and metropolitan areas, these negative impacts are becoming more and more visible and substantial. 
Therefore, future planning for urban water and climate resilience will need to consider the broader assessment of water resources and beyond, including the importance of ecosystems and basins. Because water is a connector, bringing together many other important aspects of human life, including agriculture, food, energy, ecosystem, and health, an integrated and holistic approach is needed. Water is at the core and is connecting all SDGs. In order to accelerate the implementation of SDG 6, which is unfortunately off track, the UN has launched this year in New York the SDG 6 Global Accelerator Framework, which has a potential also to have impact on other SDGs. We should manage water with other important factors in cities and seek cooperation and collaboration with other partners, bringing our boundaries and silos from technical advances, population and economic growth, and the competing demands of diverse sectors. Urban water resilience is urgently needed to ensure that no one is left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, scientists and researchers have a great role to play by contributing their professional insights, providing methodologies, advanced tools, and assessment to inform decision, therefore reinforcing the science policy interface. At UNESCO, we provide support through different programs and initiatives, such as the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, the World Water Assessment Program, and through the UNESCO Water Family, comprising 169 HP national committees alongside with the, 60, the 36 category two centers and 63 UNESCO water chairs. They will bring together a complete spectrum of expertise across the world among a diversity of subjects such as flooding, drought, sedimentation, understanding sustainable development, and the science of hydrological systems. We would like to bring these networks of networks to the service of populations across the world so that we can improve water management in mega cities. I would like to express my gratitude to all of you for joining UNESCO in this pre-conference and for sharing with us your experiences that we look forward to disseminating across the world. My sincere and humble gratitude to our colleagues of the Water Division and distinguished partners. Thank you very much for enabling us to meet here today. And I will do hope one day we'll have the pleasure to welcome you to UNESCO in Paris your home with the aim to look at water as a connector going beyond urban water management. So I would like to thank all of you and to wish you fruitful discussions and deliberations, and also to congratulate all the partners and all of you for joining us. Thank you, back to you, Alexandros. Thank you very much, uh, Abu, uh, Mr. Amani. And now, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Daniel Markovic, the president of our show, uh, to continue with the opening remarks. Daniel? Madam, Monsieur Chazen. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is for me a honor and a pleasure to open today the work of the pre-conference Omega 2021. 
the event is taking place in a situation which is totally new for us because we had to sort of reorganize the preparatory work that we had done two years ago and over two years to put in place uh, the international conference, the second uh, such conference on water megacities and global change. And we hope to be able to organize it uh, in person in December 2021. We can be sure of the presence of hundreds of uh, people because we have received call for presentations for 435 uh, summaries from all over the world. This year, we wish that a maximum listeners be able to participate in this meeting, which uh, had us focus these sessions on uh, short uh, time slots accessible in Asia and in the Americas and the program in, of this pre-conference over a period of five days. I add that the dates had been chosen to come as a preamble to the event that has been co-organized on the 12th of December by the Secretary General of the United Nations and the British Prime Minister in order to mark the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. At this occasion, the ASSO Association has put online on its website a call to support the alliances of mega cities for water and climate that we invite you to sign. I want to add here that the form of Visio conference presents in my eyes an immense advantage, making it accessible to thousands of people and in particular students who would never have been able to travel to come here to be able to follow the communications and intervene by asking questions. It is clear that this model will be uh, you know, called upon to develop over the years to not only limit the carbon footprint of all big meetings that take place all over the world all through the year, but also, as I was saying initially, to increase the dissemination of knowledge and experiences towards new publics. I form the wish that the 2021 December conference be able to be transmitted live in multiple places all over the world. Without uh, further ado, I would like to also thank our partners, UNESCO, uh, Greater Paris Metropolis, the CIAP, as well as uh, the Agence de Seine Normandie and uh, Régie Eau de Paris as partners and sponsors. I would also like to thank here Mrs. Véronique Roger Lacan, the ambassador of France to UNESCO, and she is going to be honoring us uh, in closing this conference. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, we will continue the opening ceremony. Uh, moving now to our third partner, who is represented by Mr. Jean-Didier Berthaud, the Vice President of SIAP, the Greater Paris Sanitation Authority. Jean-Didier. Merci, uh, Alexandros. Thank you very much, Alexandros. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Allow me to wish you a warm welcome to this conference that, of course, we would have liked to hold live with the presence uh, of uh, all of you. And I associate myself uh, with my colleagues to welcome you here. And I would have wanted to welcome you to Paris, but uh, I hope it will be the case next week. But uh, I would like to join all those who expressed their thanks for the organizers of this uh, online pre-conference and of course our friends of UNESCO with whom we've been working hand in hand and also as well as uh, others who've got worked for months uh, for the success of this pre-conference and the success that will be the 2021 conference. SIAP, uh, just in a few words uh, for uh, viewers and listeners who don't know SIAP, it's the public service uh, of the Paris conglomeration in terms of sanitation, and it is the collect and treatment of wastewater for 10 million inhabitants of Paris and Greater Paris for a treatment of 2.5 million cubic meters a day. Uh, with 1,800 agents of the public service uh, involved in this uh, mission and a very focused mission with uh, several challenges. Uh, Seine River has uh, 330 cubic meters per second flow, uh, 1,800 
square kilometers is the area of uh, our uh, intervention. So different people from the SIAP will be speaking on different themes in the course of the five days. But I'd like to say, but in the more general framework of the opening session, we accompany, of course, this approach right from the beginning, right from the creation, the launch since 2015, as it was reminded in the course of COP21 and our institution actively participates in the organization of these two events as it did in 2015. And uh, SIAP uh, brings forward its expertise at the scale of its territory through the intermediary of its agents represented and its capacity to adapt to new challenges such as during the pre-conference there will be a, a speaker an integrated management in the yield of force which is of course at the very heart of our job and uh, CAP is also an important actor because of its international achievements uh, and hence the accompaniment of UNESCO in the last years through the exchanges that we carry out with the mega cities in the alliance of mega cities for water and climate and its involvement in the latter because SIAP is a privileged participant in adaptations in the face of climate change. There's some conventions that have already been made with some major mega cities, Mexico, Beijing, Manila, Brazil, Kinshasa which have uh, you know shared sort of problems in the face of climate change to conclude some proposals uh, within the framework of this conference uh, and that as i said is the reason for the online pre-conference obviously the pandemic uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and in the face of the health crisis that we are facing up to today, it is important to emphasize the importance of uh, sanitation in the analysis of uh, the COVID uh, in Paris and the Paris conglomeration. This is a project called Obepin and I'm sure in the course of this online conference we will have the opportunity to come back to it. It's a major, major stake, major challenge. Uh, SIAP to be able to work with the urban uh, unions to be able to work in a concerted manner and not in silos, cross-cutting manner of working. That is very important for us. And that is the example of the action that we carry out with the household waste uh, union, uh, the sick Tom in uh, the Paris suburban regions. And in Manila, there's been um, setting up of a project uh, in this field and of course the importance of the link between local representatives, scientists, operators. This is the model that structures the Alliance of Mega Cities for Water and Climate. And finally to say that CAP is a recognized actor for several years at the world scale as is shown by its participants regularly in the following events that you all know well as participants which are the World Water Week of Stockholm, World Water Forum, High Level Palum Forum, COPS of course, and the International Water Conference of UNESCO, which I mentioned in the end in order to give right away the floor once again to Alexandros. Thank you very much indeed and wish you an excellent online conference and hopefully see you in Paris very soon. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Didier, uh, for the message from SIAP. And last but not least, I would like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Sylvain Berrios, uh, who is the Vice President uh, of the Greater uh, Paris Metropolis, in charge of management of aquatic environment and flood prevention. Uh, Mr. Berrios, the floor is yours. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue dans la métropole du Grand Paris. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Welcome to the Greater Paris Metropolis. Uh, Seven million inhabitants, one million companies, 400,000 jobs and also many rivers. As you can see, I'm standing on the Marne Riverside to recall that water is an essential element of our metropolis. In the metropolis, uh, we uh, uh, live with water, around water, and sometimes water runs across our metropolis. It is a sign of good health, and sometimes it's a worrying sign. In all cases, water is a constituent element of our environment, environment protection, our biodiversity, our capacity to take our future into our own hands in the face of climate change, which, as we know, is very significant. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all the scientists, the stakeholders, all those who got mobilized for a pre-conference since the initial conference cannot be held, all those who uh, uh, got mobilized in order to maintain a real momentum so that water 
uh, is taken into account. Water is the blue dimension, as we have the green dimension. These are the uh, constituent elements of our environment, of our life. Where there is water, there is life, and that is very important. And this is what why what we need to work on together in the greater Paris metropolis, like elsewhere in the world. Um, I, I wish you good proceedings because there will never be too many of us working on this issue. Elected representatives, companies, public services, scientists, all those who help to better understand, to come up with innovation so that we can meet uh, different requirements. Some want more housing, more density, more environment protection, more jobs, more industries, but at the same time, better air quality, better water quality. Sometimes it might seem paradoxical. Well, this is the equation uh, we must solve together. And this pre-conference, uh, which will lead to a, a, a conference in 2021, I hope in person this time, I hope we will all have together part of the solution uh, that uh, will enable us to live happily, peacefully, where we choose to be. concluded the first opening statements of the conference. I would just like to uh, inform you all that we have 30 papers that will be presented by their authors on this online pre-conference. We will have two thematic sessions per day, starting almost uh, around one o'clock uh, Central European time, uh, in order to enable more, as many people as possible around the world to uh, follow the sessions. Each session will consist of three presentations of 15 minutes each, followed by a 20 minutes opening, open discussion. And in order to enhance the interaction, we have uh, invited you all to send any questions you want to the authors. Um, uh, we will start the very first session, uh, which will be presided by Mr. Fadi Komer. Uh, Mr. Fadi Komer is the Director General of the Ministry of Water and Energy in Lebanon, and he is the Chairperson of the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program. He will moderate the very first session that uh, is on disaster risk reduction. Mr. Fadi Komer, uh, the floor is yours. Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to moderate the first session entitled uh, uh, Disaster Risk Reduction for this uh, 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 second uh, pre-conference entitled uh, Water Mega Cities and Global Change. I'd like to thank our partners see uh, uh, the uh, uh, Great Paris Metropolis, uh, also Agence de l'eau. I would also like to thank our colleagues uh, from the Water Division at UNESCO, and uh, more particularly, uh, Mrs. Chamillanier Bedwell, uh, the ADG uh, for uh, 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 the uh, 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 Natural Sciences at UNESCO, and also the Director of the Water uh, uh, Division, uh, Mr. Alexandre Marcaricatis, uh, Maud Berthelot, and all the colleagues uh, uh, who endeavored and uh, carried out uh, many actions in order uh, to uh, uh, take up this challenge. It is a challenge. Uh, it's the first time that uh, we are using a video conference for the pre-conference. Uh, now the uh, uh, water division and uh, IHP as you, and the uh, scientific uh, council, uh, we are investing, investing on education because uh, we need to increase knowledge uh, on water security through uh, conferences, uh, a platform of exchange between scientists, experts, uh, decision makers, uh, uh, those who work in the area uh, of water. We live in a world 
uh, where we do not have enough uh, uh, water and uh, we are exerting pressure. Uh, there are a lot of wastage and now we have the uh, COVID-19 pandemics. Now, all uh, these uh, risks are changing uh, the way uh, uh, the uh, catchment areas uh, are managed and uh, extreme events are increasing. This is the reason why we really need to build on uh, conventional and non-conventional uh, resources in order to meet the challenges, uh, uh, namely the increase in water demand. Uh, we need to improve governance. We need to improve our relationship and partnership with the private sector. This is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure today to welcome uh, for this session three eminent speakers. The first one is uh, a professor, Marilia Carvalho de Mello, Mrs. Carvalho uh, de Mello is a professor, doctor engineer from the Federal University of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she She's an advisor at the uh, Curatorial Council of the Minas Gerais State Research uh, Support Foundation. She is Secretary of State for the Environment and Sustainable Development and General Director of the Instituto Minero de Gestão das Aguas. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, de Mello is going to uh, present a conference entitled Competition Between Multiple Uses of Water in the uh, Belo Horizonte Metropolitan Area. Now, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Uh, de Mello to uh, make her presentation. Thank you. Mrs. De Mello, you have 15 minutes uh, to uh, uh, present uh, uh, this uh, uh, paper, and then we will have a question and answer uh, session uh, so that uh, uh, the audience uh, can ask you questions about your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Good morning from Brazil here. It's 9 a.m., 9.30. It's a pleasure to be here today with all of you to present this paper, a paper that were uh, written from me uh, with uh, some partners, as you can see in the first slide. Uh, please, the next slide. So this is the summary of the presentation that I will uh, do just now. Thank you, the first one. So the concept of water security has been used worldwide to designate the objective of providing water in quantity and quality for multiple use, including the needs of aquatic ecosystems, as well as reducing the risk related to extreme hydrological events. The concept of water security uh, encourage uh, specific application to urban areas where public water supply has been a major challenge in water management. Uh, in this paper, uh, the practical evaluation of water security risk attains the selection of some stressors that I will present in advance according to the characteristics of each region, uh, their economic vocations, and especially the model of land use and occupation of the, the river basin. The next slide, please. Uh, the evaluation of water security in this paper was done in the metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte, located in the state of Minas Gerais, southeast region of Brazil. Uh, the metropolitan region is composed of 34 
cities, municipalities with 5 million inhabitants, 26% of all Minas Gerais state's population. And the GDP of 56 million uh, reais, of reais, 40% of the state GDP. Uh, the Belo Horizonte metropolitan region is contained in two river basins, Velha, Velhas River Basin and Paraupeba River Basin, both of them tributaries of São Francisco River Basin. Uh, São Francisco River flows through seven Brazilian states along 3,000 160 kilometers and uh, arrive in the Atlantic Ocean between the states of Alagoas and Sergipe, as present in this figure. The next one, please. Um, we are uh, the, re the metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte is in the Quadrilatero Ferrifero of or Iron quad, Quadrangle, uh, where there are a lot of iron mining. Uh, this is the one of economic activities, one of the most important economic uh, activities. And that's why uh, there is a lot of daily dams here in this region. Um, we have in Brazil, eight 146 daily dams in Minas Gerais, 408 uh, here in Minas Gerais and in metropolitan area of Belo Horizonte, 129 daily dams. So it's a big challenge uh, to provide water security uh, in this context. Uh, on January of 2019 in municipality of Brumadinho, Minas Gerais. Uh, Adam uh, operated a daily dam operating by company Vale SA has burst. Uh, as a result of this uh, tragedy, uh, 70 millions of cubic meters of mining waste were dumped into a uh, Paraupeba River. Uh, and because of this uh, was affect a uh, catchment for water supply in Belo Horizonte, as we can see in this image here. The dam were 19 kilometers away from a key water supply source located in Paraupeba, as is in this figure, uh, which was interrupted after the daily dam rupture. The high turbidity levels and concentration of several substances, uh, many of them toxic and in disagreement with the established environment environmental standards marked the river contamination with mining waste. This source provides five cub, uh, cubic meters per second of water, which represent approximately 30% of production capacity of water in metropolitan uh, area. Under this circumstance, uh, a lot of authorities uh, initiate a series of emergence actions to, minim to minimize the disaster impact on the public water supply and establish intervention to increase the water security in Belo Horizonte metropolitan region. So this article evaluates those actions and uh, interventions, coping then with a discussion about region risk management policy in a metropolitan area where 129 daily dams are located. 
uh, the next one, ah, the methods. Okay, that's it. Uh, this research uses public and available data from environmental agencies here in Minas Gerais states, uh, Water Resource Institute, uh, and the water utility responsible for water supply and sanitation for Belo Horizonte metropolitan area, as well as some documents from the process that run in the second court of public treasure and autarky of Belo Horizonte. Uh, the water supply uh, to Belo Horizonte metropolitan region comp comprise too many systems, too main systems, source on the Velhas and Paraupebla river watershed produce uh, 16.7 cubic meters per second together that represent 91% of water production. Uh, as we can see here, we have uh, the Rio das Velhas and this part is all Paraupeba system. In Rio das Velhas uh, Basin, there is an abstraction site in the municipality of Nova Lima, which provides about 6.95 cubic meters per second, and current authorization allows withdraw 9 met cubic meters per second uh, from the source. In Paraupeba River Basin, there are three reservoirs uh, where in named Rio Manso, is named Rio Manso, Serra Azul, and Vargem das Flores, which currently supply 5.33, 1.18, and 1.14 cubic meters, respectively. The next one, please. So, uh, we do the evaluation of risk associated with public water supply in this region based on the evaluation of some stressors selection selected uh, by the authors considering the characteristics of this region. Assessed through this stressor, assessed through the parameters that represent and turn possible the measure of these stressors. As we can see here in this table, uh, we select four stressors, pressure on environmental conditions uh, measured by the area without, without natural vegetation cover, uh, water demand, uh, which is the relationship between the amount of water available to use and the effective use of water in this basin. Pollution load uh, measured by the water quality index and the number of tailings then upstream of these sources. The next one, please. Uh, and we do the evaluate the we evaluate uh, the actions uh, that are being done here in this region by uh, the process information the information of the process as I told as I, I told before which run in the second public treasure treasury and altar key court in, Be in Belo Horizonte. The next one, please. Next one, please. Yes, so here are the results. The first analysis was about the pressure, pressure on environmental condition of the river basin. Uh, and as we can see in this figure, the area upstream of Velhas River uh, section is characterized by a large and continuous portion of natural vegetation, occupying 38.6% uh, of the basin. In Paraupeba, uh, in Paraupeba, the area upstream of water supply source 
is dominant by anthropic use such as pasture and agriculture that represent 67.6% of the basin. In the catchments of the reservoirs, Rio Manso, Serra Azul, and Vargem das Flores, uh, the predominant occupation around these reservoirs are forests uh, with 4, 48.7%, 45.6%, .6%, respectively, uh, in Rio Manso and Serra Azul uh, reservoirs. Vargem das Flores uh, system is in a urbanization area and the urbanization is the main stressor factor within the basin. The urban area occupy 24.4% uh, of the basin area. The next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this slide shows the water stress indices index that represent the relationship between the amount of water available to use considering the state environment rules and the authorized flow. As we can see here in this uh, figure uh, and in this table as well, uh, Rio das Velhas Basin is one of the bigger stress uh, in all of the basins that use water for water supply in this region. The next one, please. The next one uh, present the water quality index. Each of these small circles represent a water quality monitoring point, as well as, um, as we can see, uh, the Rio das Velhas system and Paraupeba catchment base have the worst condition of water quality, as we can see in this basin and this big basin. The next one, please. And uh, the last stressor, uh, the daily dams uh, located in each Belo Horizonte metropolitan region supply source were in the identified and quantified the corresponding stability, stability condition was evaluated according to the independent audit of the interpreter. As we can see uh, in Paraupeba system and Rio das Velhas system as well, we have the worst condition with uh, a lot of daily dams and in Rio das Velhas system, 13 daily dams uh, without stability guaranteed, guaranteed. The next one, please. So uh, this table summarize uh, all the stressors evaluation for an integrated evaluation of the risk of security water security in Belo Horizonte metropolitan region supply. Uh, as we can see, uh, Rio das Velhas system is the one that has uh, more risk related to water supply in all the basin. And Rio Paraupeba system, the one which was interrupted uh, due to the daily dam burst uh, was the second one. The next slide, please. Thank you for concluding, uh, Professor okay. De Melo. Okay. So here is the emergent uh, that actions that we do, and I'm going to the conclusion. So the main conclusion uh, is that the rupture of valley dams in Brumadinho interrupt the water supply from Paraupeba River and drew attention to the vulnerability of the water supply system in Belo Horizonte region. It also called for the discussion about risk management policy for public water supply in order to set up con 
contingency plans and reduce the risk of shortage in the capital of Minas Gerais state and in this metropolitan region. Uh, it was an important uh, role of public uh, ministry of Minas Gerais. That Cette conversation va être enregistrée. So, uh, I think the time is uh, run and I'll be available for any question that you have. Thank you very much. Merci, uh, Madame uh, la Professeur. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, De, Mello, De Mello, for this uh, extremely interesting and pedagogical uh, presentation. And uh, uh, there will be questions and answers at the end of this session. I would now like to give the floor to our second speaker, um, Mr. Jean-Stéphane Claon. Mr. Claon is a doctor of the University of Montpellier uh, in hydrology. He's a, a pharmacist uh, by training. He is uh, currently the uh, Director General for Water Quality and Director of uh, the Abidjan UNEP Laboratory. He has carried out uh, uh, a number of research uh, projects focusing on access to water, water quality, and assessment of water quality impact on um, hydraulic uh, uh, water availability in developed country. His presentation uh, is uh, titled uh, Water Scarcity in African Cities and Tropic Factors or Climate Change. The case of Bouaké, Ivory Coast. Mr. Claon, you have the floor. You have 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to introduce this presentation. I'm speaking from Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa. And my presentation will be related to the water scarcity in African cities and to pick factors or climate change, the case of Boaké in Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa. My presentation summary will be a short introduction. And after this introduction, we'll present the method we use, the result we get, and finally, the conclusion. Next slide, please. According to UNICEF and WHO, water availability is one of the basic need, human need to be met in adequate quantity and quality. So for fast growing population of African cities, that are facing the challenge of accessing adequate water resource to, meet, to meet this demand. In tropical areas where water resources only depend on rainfall, climate change, and human activity could result in water scarcity. This kind of environmental and human disaster appears to be a rising issue in many African cities as the case of Boaké. The objective of this study was to assess the impact of anthropic activities and rainfall variation related to climate on water resource scarcity to meet the water demand of the city of Boaké. Next slide, please. In 2018, Boaké, which is the second largest city of Côte d'Ivoire, a West African country, experienced a water shortage. Uh, this shortage resulted from the, the drying up of the Loka Dam, which is on the Loka River, and which is the city main drinking water resource. As you can see in the figure, um, the 
drainage basin of the Loka is on the center of the country, and it's shared it share through three departments, and the dam has been uh, built in 10 kilometers downstream the river. This dam uh, initially had an overhaul water capacity of 25 million cubic meter per year with a drinking water production from the plant of 30,000 cubic meter per day. And as a result of the shortage, about 1.5 million inhabitants were left without drinking water, leading to a major, major public health issue. Next slide, please. So the method we used to, for our assessment was to assess climate variation through the rainfall characterization. And this rainfall- L'enregistrement a été interrompu. This rainfall characterization from 1980 to 2018 was done using the standardized precipitation index. And this standardized precipitation index is calculated according to the formula where Xi is the cumulative rainfall for the year I, minus Xm, that is the average rainfall observed in a given period, divided by the standard deviation of the annual rainfall recorded for a given period, that is SI. And the figure two gave the SPI interpretation. So the SPI range can be from minus two to plus two, with minus two is related to high growth and plus two to an extreme humidity. Next slide. The other way we use is to impact, to assess the impact of anthropic activities through land use by a geospatial mapping, satellite images were taken from several years to better understand the dynamic of land use. And also we, we, learn, we, we have a field survey that allow to see the dam surface evaluation and other field activities in the drainage basin. Next slide. Then we come to our result. While accessing the rainfall characterization based on the standard precipitation index SPI, the figure, the chart two, gives three different areas where we collected and we measured the, the, um, the SPI from this department of Botro, that is the first one, to the second department of Boaké and the third department of Sakasu. And all these, those departments share the drainage basin of the Loka River and the dam. And for Boutrou and Sakasu, that's the first and the last one, SPI show a high to extreme humidity rainfall trend, while for Boaké, SPI display a moderate humidity trend. This SPI data obtained in this study reveal an inconclusive rainfall change. Therefore, no significant climate impact. Next slide. The other uh, uh, method we used was the, to assess the anthropic activity to land use. Satellite images were taken from 1986 to 2018. As you can see in the figure three, from the left to the right, and from the top to the down, uh, four satellite image from the, this place was taken, where the green colors, the light green and the, the dark green color was related to forest and savanna, where the blue color is, was, is related to water resources. 
the orange color is for ground and houses, and the, the orange color is for cultivate land, sorry, and the yellow color for ground and houses. And as we can see, if you look at this different picture, a noticeable increase of surface of crops and bear occur all the time. That makes the picture becoming more yellow and orange. And we can see a constant decrease of water resources like the blue and the green color. So the study of land sh show a significant change related to anthropic activity in the river drainage basin, water, forest, and savanna have disappeared over the time. Next slide. Then if we go to the field survey, the field survey reveal a sun mining activity in the river drainage basin. Mining activities impacted the environment, allowing carries mostly located by the river and upstream of the dam. As you can see in the figure four, where several carries were was seen, observed in the drainage basin. By holding large amounts of water, carries decrease the runoff coefficient of the water drainage basin and reduce water flow to the Laka Dam. Uh, next slide. And through the field survey, we were able to, to measure the, the local dam reduction. And as you can see in the chart, from 27, 2017, sorry, and to 2018, there was a, a, a very important reduction of the dam surfaces. So this reduction of the dam was just like the surface went from two kilometers square to less than half kilometers kilometer square, sorry, from 1986 to 2018. And this drying up process that began in February was completed in April 2018. So what kind of conclusion can we come from this study? In 2018, the city of Waké in Côte d'Ivoire, West Africa, with about 1.5 million inhabitants experienced an extreme, extreme water shortage. The assessment of the impact of the climate through rainfall characterization and through the SPI, Standard uh, Precipitation Index, revealed an inconclusive rainfall change. Therefore, no significant climate impact. Study of the land uh, that was used to assess the human activity, uh, anthropic activity, and the field survey showed that water forest and savanna had disappeared over the time. Additionally, carries resulting from sand mining activity have impacted the river drainage basin. Therefore, the drying up of the local dam and consequently, consequently the water shortage may be related to anthropic activities. Water scarcity in the city of Waké and such kind of issue that happen in different African city calls for additional research on water governance, water management, water policy, and its role in the societal and economic development of African cities. So I want to conclude my presentation by thank you, thanking you for your attention. Thank you. Merci au Dr. Jean-Stéphane Claon pour cet excellent... Thank you very much uh, to uh, Professor Claon for this excellent presentation. Uh, you have uh, presented us uh, with the water shortage uh, uh, through anthropic uh, reasons and also climate change with a lot of uh, formulae and adaptation plans. And I congratulate you. I would now like to give the floor to our third uh, speaker. Our third speaker is uh, Mr. Engineer El 
Buenani. Mr. El Buenani is currently Director of Development and Operations in Tetuan. He has a long standing experience in water management, uh, management of energy and supply of electricity. So the management of the nexus in the public service supply. Mr. Yunus El Bonini is going to present his conference, which is called uh, Parameters, Water Parameters in the North of Morocco, Mitigation and Adaptation. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, bonjour, uh, Monsieur le Moderateur. Bonjour à tous. Good morning. Uh, uh, ma présentation uh, s'intitule uh, Atténuation de l'impact du stress hydrique uh, au nord du Royaume du Maroc. In, uh, euh, on va passer donc euh, voir un petit peu en revue les, les principaux acteurs du secteur de l'eau au Maroc et on verra quelles étaient les, les actions qui ont été mises en place pour euh, atténuer donc l'impact du stress hydrique sur sur la population. Suivant, si donc, la ville de Tétouan, donc pour le site géographique. Donc de la grande région de Tanger, Tétouan, El Husseima. Euh, sa population, donc, elle est de l'ordre de 760 000 habitants sur une superficie de 109 000 hectares. Euh, la région de Tétouan, avec euh, sa zone côtière ou sa zone de littoral, à un climat de type méditerranéen. méditerranéen. Euh, il connaît en général deux saisons, donc une saison humide pluvieuse allant du mois de allant, allant du mois d'octobre au mois d'avril, suivi d'une saison jusqu'au mois de septembre. La métrie en moyen, il est en, en moyen, il est de 700 700 mm. Par an. Donc, côté climatique, so on constate sur, <coughs> sur la courbe qui est sur votre gauche une, une régression des précipitations de, de moins 6% au moyen sur les 20 dernières années euh, et en même temps une augmentation des températures maximales en été de plus de 2 degrés Celsius. Euh, autrement dit, au moment où on a le plus besoin d'eau, on a le moins de précipitations. Donc, euh, l'arrivée de la gestion déléguée euh, a accéléré l'accès à l'eau. Le, le nombre de clients euh, qu'on voit sur, la courbe de, sur, sur votre courbe de droite a augmenté de plus 174% d'abonnés supplémentaires, en plus, en plus des nouveaux arrivants attirés par la ville de Tétouan, qui est une destination balnéaire méditerranéenne très populaire, très populaire en été. D'où la nécessité de sécuriser l'ensemble des de cycles de production distribution de l'eau potable. Euh, le secteur de, de l'eau compte plusieurs Now, acteurs <coughs> et parties prenantes. Uh, euh, donc, uh, commençons uh, donc uh, par uh, l'acteur, l'acteur qui est l'État marocain, uh, qui est en charge de la réglementation et de la tarification. L'agence du bassin de Lucus pour le Nord donc assure la gestion des ressources en eau brute au niveau des barrages, des forages, des pluies, etc. L'Office national de, de, de l'eau de et de, de l'électricité qui a la charge de la production et de traitement des eaux, des eaux brutes. Le régulateur qui est, qui est un organe de surveillance du secteur et de respect de toutes les dispositions contractuelles. Et le MNDIS qui est société filiale du groupe Violia qui assure la, la distribution de l'eau, la collecte de, 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 des eaux usées, la collecte et le traitement des eaux usées ainsi que la distribution d'électricité et les délégataires des services depuis 2002 jusqu'à aujourd'hui. 
Au fait, les associations et les communautés locales. En termes de levier d'action, on peut citer les plus importants qui ont été mis en, qui ont été mis en place durant, ces, durant les 20 dernières années. Un, c'est d'abord sécuriser la ressource en eau brute, dont la capacité de stockage en 20 ans est passée de 45 millions de mètres cubes à 198 millions de mètres cubes. La réduction des pertes qui se traduit en efficacité de réseau eau potable, qui est passée en presque 20 ans de 53% à 81%. La troisième action, c'est la, 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 la réduction du gaspillage via la réglementation et la tarification, en plus des campagnes de sensibilisation qui permettent de réduire la consommation spécifique des ménages qui est passée de 5, 115 à 99 litres jours par habitant. Suivant, s'il vous plaît. Donc, l'eau brute vient essentiellement, provient essentiellement des barrages, des barrages collinières représentant plus de 90% de, de ressources du fait de la faible productivité des nappes, mais aussi parce que les ressources en eau sont exclusivement disponibles en hiver en raison de la pluviométrie, alors que les besoins sont plutôt concentrés dans la période ou pendant la période estivale, compte tenu du caractère balnéaire de la région, d'où la nécessité de stocker la ressource. En effet, entre 2002 et 2018, euh, l'État marocain a réalisé d'importants investissements par, uh, par la construction de deux, de deux barrages, euh, euh, faisant passer euh, la capacité de stockage de 43 millions de mètres cubes à 198 millions de mètres cubes. Et, 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 de, et du coup, donc l'autonomie de stockage est passée de, de un an à, à quatre. Slide suivant, s'il vous plaît. Euh, ce graphique nous ramène un petit peu à la crise que, que la zone de, de la zone de Tétouan, plus précisément donc au nord-ouest de, de, du Maroc, euh, nous ramène à la crise du stress hydrique euh, vécu euh, en 2016. Euh, D'abord, euh, euh, comme on peut le voir sur les deux pictos, donc entre octobre 2015, le, le stockage il était de 40% et en octobre 2016, le stockage était seulement de 12%. Euh, donc, donc cette crise il vient d'abord de la faible pluviométrie sur les trois dernières années, donc de 2013 à 2015, ainsi que sur le retard, de, sur le retard des travaux de réalisation du nouveau barrage Sharif Idrissi, d'une capacité de 120 millions de mètres. Euh, durant cette crise, il a fallu euh, restreindre de 30% la distribution de potable et la gérer pendant moins euh, en, pendant trois mois, en espérant l'arrivée des premiers pays. Bien sûr, chaque crise, il a un côté, euh, son côté positif. Euh, ce côté positif a servi euh, premièrement de, de, de réaliser une interconnexion donc, euh, de 25 km entre deux barrages existants, accélérer les travaux de réalisation du nouveau barrage à Sharif et Idrissi, euh, euh, mettre en place le financement nécessaire pour le projet de Rius permettant l'arrosage la, euh, des espaces verts, des espaces verts publics. Prochain slide, s'il vous plaît. Next slide, please. Euh, non, le, plutôt le suivant. Next. Next slide, please. Non. Avant, avant s'il vous plaît. Non, avant ce slide. Si on peut revenir au point avant ça. Non, non, juste. Non, ce n'est pas la bonne page, le speaker, juste avant ça, s'il vous plaît. Ici, voilà. Donc, euh, sur la courbe que vous voyez à, que vous voyez à, à, à droite, euh, vous voyez qu'au niveau de, au niveau de l'année 2016, donc euh, les ressources étaient, étaient au minimum et, et, et le barrage qui a été construit juste après, il est venu un peu combler le le combler la capacité de la capacité de stockage qui était mon compte avant avant 2000. Suivant, s'il vous plaît. Next slide, please. Euh, L'eau brute, donc, euh, suivant. Euh, 
Voilà. Donc, euh, après, donc, euh, donc le, le, donc, euh, l'amélioration de la capacité de stockage, la deuxième action, il so, concerne uh, la, la réduction des, la réduction des pertes. La réduction des pertes euh, sur, sur les réseaux, euh, sur les réseaux euh, M10. Euh, donc, on, on a vu que euh, donc, euh, le rendement, il est passé de, il est passé de, de 50, so 51% uh, à, à, à 81%. Donc, ceci, bien sûr, en mettant en, Now, en sur place un ensemble, un ensemble d'actions qui consiste d'abord à, à équiper l'ensemble des, des clients par, par des, des, des compteurs with, individuels. Uh, individual euh, juste à, après, donc, on a mis en place un ensemble d'équipements euh, hydrauliques, notamment donc, le, euh, des compteurs sectoriels qui permettent, qui permettent qui permettent donc Then moyennant donc un système de télégestion to, uh, de les de superviser via un, 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 un système SCADA uh, tout ce qui se passe au niveau de, de réseau system, so euh, euh, donc euh, euh, au niveau de donc des pertes réseau donc And ils ont été réduits de pratiquement de de de, euh, de cinq donc ils ont été five, divisés divisés par cinq en même temps, donc, euh, en même temps, donc, le, le taux de raccordement il est passé de, de 61% en 2002 à 96% en 2018. Donc, le réseau a été étendu moyennant un, un, un plan, un plan de donc d'extension de, de, de réseau. Slide suivant, s'il vous plaît. Next slide, please. Voilà. Euh, alors. Euh, ici, on voit donc euh, here, au niveau des, 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 des courbes, donc the, uh, à droite, uh, donc the, plutôt à gauche, uh, on, on voit que le rendement, side, donc le rendement, donc il augmente de, de 51% à, à 81%. 81%. Sur sur la courbe de sur la courbe de uh, à gauche à gauche en bas, on, uh, on voit que curve, donc les, les consommations donc il il augmente aussi. Sur la courbe en bas à, à droite, on, 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 on voit tous les volumes qui ont été, qui ont été euh, économisés et, et ça a représenté pendant cette période euh, une, euh, un volume de 110 millions de mètres cubes euh, qui, qui permet d'alimenter la zone de, la zone de tétons pendant quatre ans. You know, supplied water voilà. to the dead slide zone suivant, for a period of four years. Next slide, please. Next. Donc, en termes de, de, en termes de, on arrive donc à l'action numéro trois, l'action numéro trois qui concerne donc la, ré, la réglementation du service de l'eau, notamment tarifaire, uh, qui est décidé au niveau national, tariffs, uh, même si les prix uh, varient, uh, varient d'une ville à l'autre. Euh, la, grille tarifaire comprend de, de, la grille tarifaire comprend plusieurs usages. Euh, et, et pour chaque usage, on peut avoir plusieurs tarifs. La facturation, elle est passée d'un mode progressif en 2014 à un mode sélectif pour les, les, les trois tranches les plus, les plus chères, euh, au-delà de 12 mètres cubes. Dans, dans ce graphique, on peut distinguer euh, euh, trois, trois zones. Une zone avant, avant mise en place de, du nouveau mode de tarification, euh, une zone au moment de passage à ce nouveau mode de tarification, une zone un petit peu de perturbation, et euh, juste après, donc, une zone pour le retour à la, à la répartition initiale, la répartition des volumes initiales. Si on focalise sur cette période de perturbation, on constate que les volumes des tranches progressives euh, basculent vers les volumes tranches élevées au premier mètre cube de plus que 12 mètres cubes. Euh, conséquence, la facturation donc, elle est plus chère, ce qui va euh, pousser les consommateurs à revoir leurs habitudes pour baisser leur consommation et ainsi revenir sur, sous la barre des 12 mètres cubes. En plus, donc, il a fallu mener des campagnes de sensibilisation et, et faire donc, plus de pédagogie, qu'on qu peut le voir juste après, pour revenir à cette répartition de, 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 des volumes. Des vo des volumes de vente euh, initiaux. Uh, sales, initial sales Suivant ce Next slide, please. Le, le, donc, euh, 
le nouveau mode de tarification, donc, so il, il a eu un fort uh, impact uh, sur la facture. Les, les, les actions de communication de, et de sensibilisation ont été renforcées, donc, uh, ont été renforcées pour essayer d'amener le consommateur à revoir leurs habitudes de consommation, réduire le gaspillage et ainsi rester à des niveaux de facture qui sont sur 300 000 euh, nouveaux clients donc, en 2000, 2018 du fait de l'augmentation du de taux de couverture et de la popularité de estival de la, de la destination de, de la région de Tétan. Et en partie, euh, et en partie parce que donc euh, euh, d'autres habitants donc euh, qui avaient accès à l'eau gratuitement auparavant doivent dérénavant payer pour, pour ce service. Donc au fur et à mesure des expansions, des bornes fontaines ont été supprimées, les clients doivent rationaliser leur consommation pour maîtriser leur facture. Donc un ensemble de moyens de sensibilisation. Can I invite you to conclude, uh, please, uh, says the moderator. À la, à la conclusion, donc. Donc, euh, voilà, en conclusion, donc, euh, on peut synthétiser la stratégie mise en, mis en, en, en œuvre pour, pour la préservation de la ressource comme, sur 20 ans, comme euh, la sécurisation du stockage des, des eaux brutes, qui, qui a été donc, augmentée de 300 en passant de 50 ans. Says the interpreter cannot hear the speaker anymore. Mr. Comer, we have lost the speaker. You might conclude the session. The presentations of the session. So I would like to uh, thank Mr. El Buenani for his excellent presentation. Uh, Mr. El Buenani uh, presented the uh, adaptation uh, plan in order to uh, mitigate uh, water shortage in the northern part of uh, Morocco. Uh, he made his presentation and supported uh, his comments uh, with the uh, graphs. Now, I'd like to move on to uh, the uh, question and answer session. Now, Mrs. De Melo, I have two questions uh, for you. It is a summary of all the questions that we've received for you. Professor, here is the first question. What are the impacts of uh, uh, chemical contaminants uh, in uh, uh, the uh, public water supply in the region uh, following uh, uh, the uh, break of the dam? And the second question, how did the government of uh, Belo Horizonte with the 34 uh, municipalities got organized to supply water following this incident and what are the uh, actions uh, which were planned and the adaptation plans adopted thank you professor for uh, answering these two uh, questions thank you very much for the questions uh, the first one the tailing them uh, there were uh, was a uh, I wrote them so we had a lot of turbity uh, in the Paraupeba River and then we suspend the use of this water supply so uh, this is was the main uh, impact that we we had for the water supply in metropolitan region of Belo Horizonte uh, we the government organized uh, with all the the areas, uh, health area, environmental area, and all of policy policemen uh, and the all the organizations of the government. And then uh, after the dam rupture, uh, it was necessary to undertake several measures to in order to minimize 
the impacts of the damage and the damage caused by the disaster. The first uh, measure was a sign uh, term of commitment between the public prosecutor office of Minas Gerais, the Vale, and Minas Gerais state government and the water supply company of Minas Gerais to guarantee uh, that the enterprise, the valley, uh, can construct another uh, point of source use here in uh, the basin. And uh, the last uh, uh, question, we, above the, the construction of a new source, uh, it's very important that we are discussing today to development, to developing an intense and detailed region development plans. So uh, with some relevant concepts like environmental protection of the region, uh, like uh, green and blue infrastructure strategies. Uh, another important uh, thing is grow, we are growing the interest in alternative source of water supply, in, particularly, in, par in particular rainwater uh, revesting and reuse to, of water to meet the demands that are growing in this region. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Professor Damello, for your answers. Uh, they were uh, short and clear. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now, I wish you good luck in your mission in uh, uh, Brazil. Now, let me turn to uh, Mr. Clown. Uh, I will also summarize the questions uh, which were uh, asked following uh, your presentation. Now, the question is as follows. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, study presented on anthropic factors, was it the main reason for water scarcity or are there other activities like farming activities, mining activities. Thank you for uh, giving us uh, uh, some clarification following these questions. we saw a drastic change. And the main reason for this stretching thing according to us was this mining activities. Thank you uh, for your uh, answer. Is there is any relation between uh, the water quality and the SPI in, in this area? Is there is any relation for that or? or Okay, when we start to study, there was some trend that the, the, this region was affected by climate change. There was some different study that's saying that there was there may be a climate change impact uh, through rainfall, so that the climate change may mainly reduce the rainfall. So we use this index, the SPI, in order to assess this, this fact. And after our study, there was no, no trend that for our region and for the space where we study that the, 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 the rainfall can be the cause of the, uh, the, the system or the SPI can be, uh, has been uh, show a, a significant climate change. Thank you so much for this clarification. 
I go you. back to our last uh, conferencier. On a été coupé, uh, Monsieur so, Younes. So, Mr. Younes, sorry, uh, you were concluding when we lost uh, the sound, uh, luckily, uh, and uh, the, your uh, uh, presentation was uh, uh, highly uh, instructive. Uh, uh, and since Morocco has made a lot of progress uh, in uh, water management. So uh, on the basis of your vast experience in Morocco, what are the leverages that can be uh, envisaged to maintain the quality and availability of water uh, resources? Is it uh, the uh, uh, integrated uh, management uh, of uh, water resources, technical uh, um, component and, and uh, governance uh, um, oui. component, Merci. or what are the other donc, possibilities to explore donc, les, in the future? Les leviers, uh, les leviers, Now, donc, uh, the levers, les leviers uh, pas en de, there, there, there are many levers in terms pour, uh, of uh, pour la de la actions to be undertaken uh, to preserve sûr, water uh, uh, resources. La question uh, se pose plutôt sur uh, la, la difficulté uh, de, de mettre en place un tel levier. Moi, je vais en citer seulement of, deux, uh, deux leviers. I'll speak about uh, these uh, uh, le premier levier qui est maintenant uh, en cours, uh, uh, c'est celui de, de, de protéger des nappes it assez fragiles. Uh, les nappes assez fragiles uh, au niveau donc de contenu uh, de leur proximité, water, uh, leur proximité uh, uh, de, de la mer. Uh, en effet, donc uh, ces nappes uh, uh, sont exposées à une forte Now, pression en période uh, estivale, uh, ce qui augmente le, le risque d'intrusion d'intrusion marine. L'État par le biais de l'agence l'agence hydraulique uh, can uh, compte mettre uh, dans les années that, donc dans les années qui viennent en place ce qu'on appelle des, come, des, des contrats de nappe ces contrats de nappe uh, uh, ils ont pour objectif uh, premièrement uh, donc d'inciter les, les usagers quand je dis usagers au sens large qui va de, du producteur, distributeur, industriel, à prendre conscience d'abord de l'importance de ces nappes. Deuxième objectif, c'est de réglementer un peu l'usage, l'usage qu'on fait avec ces nappes. Troisièmement, c'est responsabiliser l'usage sur l'exploitation de l'exploitation de, de ces nappes. Deuxième levier, donc, que je veux bien partager à vous. C'est le levier uh, comptable des, des eaux de pluie par la collecte the, des eaux de toiture the, pour divers usages. Ce, ce système existait uh, il y a cinq siècles au nord du Maroc et dans toutes les villes historiques du Maroc. Uh, uh, ago, pas mal d'expériences sont, sont dans d'autres pays comme la Chine, l'Argentine ou l'Allemagne qui consiste uh, uh, donc à utiliser donc les eaux de toiture the, the pour leurs différents usages. My colleagues uh, uh, from the Intergovernmental Hydrological Merci. Program for this excellent uh, uh, organization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci. Thank you to all.
Messieurs, la session connaissance des conditions techniques et sociales va commencer. Nous passons la parole dès maintenant. Ladies and gentlemen, the session knowledge of the technical and social conditions will start. I'll give the floor now to moderator, Mr. Um, Dominique Gattel. Uh, Uh, Monsieur Dominique Gattel, nous n'avons pas le retour de votre son. A review of the grassroots solutions. Uh, in other words, uh, we are looking towards the future and investigating a number of potential solutions. Um, bear with me with, for the accent, uh, but I'll be moderating that session in English. Uh, and without further ado, because we were somewhat late, uh, we will start uh, with the first speaker. Uh, it's actually uh, two voices presentation. Um, Unless, I mean, I'm talking to the organizers, uh, do we manage and uh, liaise with uh, Priyan Ali both and uh, the other speakers? On all, the speakers all the speakers are online. You can go okay, on. Okay, excellent. So we start as scheduled. All right. So we have uh, two voices presentation to start with. Uh, Soham Mahander um, is a validation engineer at Sirius Logic in Austin, Texas. He has a master in electrical engineering from the University of Florida in 2017. And we also have uh, Priyamni Hali Bose in, out of India. Uh, she's the lead of water and governance uh, consultancy at the Department of Urban and Development for the Indian state of West Bengal. And she has a master in water policy and governance from Tata Institute of Social Sciences in India. With that, over to you. I don't know which one starts first. Uh, you have 15 minutes, please. Go ahead. Thank you so much, sir. Hello, everyone. My name is Priyanshi Bose, and I'm speaking from Calcutta in India. Thank you so much for providing this opportunity to me and Soham. I hope that everyone is doing uh, well in these hard times. So without further delaying, I would uh, like to start with the title of the presentation. So as you can see that uh, the title of the presentation is self-explanatory and it's basically talking about uh, the, the, first of all, it's talking about the word institutions. And by institutions, we're basically trying to uh, understand the norms, the value, and we are basically trying to understand the institution better Uh, in, in around the informal settlements in India. Now, by the informal settlements, I uh, mean the settlements which are uh, not registered and uh, they are not notified, basically. So these settlements do not have uh, documents. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, uh, as you can see that our work basically consists of the current approach. Uh, it consists of the methodology and the innovative uh, you know, tools. 
So moving on uh, to the next part, uh, it's basically about the current approach where water stress is, uh, you know, an important factor as we're uh, talking about, and uh, water stress is very important. And uh, 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 what we are trying to uh, understand is the scarcity. Scarcity is not just the reason for, you know, the uh, the the issue with water management. The stress is also another important uh, issue. So that's why we have tried to understand the numerical, you know, uh, the the figures over here, as you can see in the slide. And if you closely look at the uh, the the kind of the distribution of water uh, through the pipe water supply, which is the portable water supply, uh, in the in the formal uh, you know slums, it is five percent, which is absolutely negligible. And that is what we've been trying to look at in you know the western part of India, the northern part, as well as in the e eastern part of the India uh, across fed, uh, across these case studies uh, uh, about what sort of you know informal settlements that has happened and what is the you know framework uh, that we are trying to uh, you know uh, we take up and understand the setup at the first place so uh, also this is also trying to you know uh, make us understand that uh, moving ahead nine to ten years we, it, it is going to be difficult to you know achieve the sustainable development goal six which talks about clean water and sanitation and across the municipal acts in india it's uh, it's very well established that without the land right there will be no water access so again it is against the uh, you know article 21 of the indian constitution it's against the right to life that you will not be you know uh, given the access to water and as you can see that more and more urban population is increasing every year, even uh, um, be it for the climate crisis, be it for, you know, livelihood or migration. And as you can see that India holds 13 position. So we also try to understand what would be the way to collect the data because there are very negligible data uh, available in the informal, uh, informal areas. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see that uh, you know the our relevance of the work is majorly it uh, it's it's talking about what sort of uh, you know framework that we are trying to uh, we are trying to you know uh, uh, we're trying to work it out for the for the for understanding the status of the informal or the non-defined institutions over here. We are trying to also closely observe the slum types. We are also proposing what should be the way the mechanisms through which the field could be tested. And lastly, we're trying to find out some way out to analyze these you know uh, water supply institutions and suggest some improvements for them and definitely uh, there should should be a reuse for uh, these for some of the uh, institutions if at all possible next slide please next slide please yeah, thank you. So over here, this is the major uh, part that we are talking about that the methodology. Uh, this is basically, uh, you know, it's divided into a small scale building blocks, actually. And as you can see, the building blocks are closely connected as and when uh, me and my colleague will be discussing about the, you know, the uh, the uh, part, uh, the parts of the design. Uh, so as you can see that the blocks are uh, in, in the first part, the design part one, we're trying to understand the features for the slums, which are under the investigation and with the help of some relevant water metrics and what are these metrics we're going to discuss in the upcoming slides. Next is the compartmentalizing the water supply institutions, which we are trying to understand that, you know, uh, breaking down and categorizing these water in supply institutions uh, uh, by, uh, by certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, by understanding whether it is a general uh, institution or a general uh, kind of uh, uh, institution or is it a slum specific condition. Next, we are trying to also uh, uh, give a road map and the followed by uh, the tools, which is explained in the walkthrough uh, presentation. As you can see that, you know, the entire uh, picturization of the methodology that I was talking about till now. So the non-notified slums have the criteria of climate. We've selected the criteria as climate and population. I'm going to discuss it in the next part. Uh, the design part two is basically trying to understand that what sort of, you know, observations were made, uh, which could have similar findings. The part three is basically trying to understand the workflow divide when a field investigator or policy practitioner is visiting a particular, uh, uh, you know, informal slum settlement to understand the situation. And the fourth part is basically talking about the, uh, after the collection of the data, what sort of information that needs to, you know, be uh, taken out from the data collected so that we can understand improvement of the institutions. Next slide, please. 
So the next slide is basically we're trying to understand the climate and population. Uh, we've, uh, uh, you know, chalked out the metrics as climate and population. Uh, so now why uh, climate? So basically climate is directly influencing. Uh, it's directly, you know, it's uh, impacting the water resource, uh, you know, uh, distribution. So that's why we uh, we thought that climate would be a, a good, uh, you know, metric. And apart from that, the population is certainly another important metric because it definitely defines what sort of you know quantity of, of, of water would be uh, you know distributed across and who will access the water. So we thought that these two would be the uh, you know major important relevant metrics. Apart from that, we we were we stuck to you know population size of less than 2,000, 2,000, 10,000, and greater than 2,000, primarily depending upon the fact that uh, in case of a country uh, like India, uh, the uh, informal slum settlements, we wanted to look at the slum settlements which are you know uh, which are there which have been there for more than 20 years and uh, as per our research and observations the slum settlements uh, you know of uh, which have uh, which have settled uh, more than 10 to 20 years have a population of at least more than 2000 therefore we thought that 2000 then 2000 to 10000 and greater than 10000 would be you know a feasible option to understand uh, uh, the informal slum settlements uh, apart from that we, uh, we 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 thought of not you know, intervening into uh, smaller uh, informal settlements, primarily because they are of migratory nature, and therefore the water supply institution might not be strong enough over there at the first place. Uh, so these are the slum descriptions and the types and the tags that we thought. And the next part would be explained by my colleague. I request my colleague to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So the first part was about uh, categorizing the slums into uh, particular characteristics. Now for a field investigator, what needs to be done is uh, figuring out what water supply institutions are available uh, in a particular slum settlement. Now there are a lot of water su supply institutions in a slum and then there are so many uh, slum settlements all around. So it's a, it's a mammoth task for a field practitioner. So what do we do? So what we do is a water supply institution has to be observed in connection to a slum settlement. Therefore, we have to bin these water supply institutions into a few types. Uh, this will help us in uh, our next design parts uh, because uh, once we have, once we observe water supply institutions in conjunction to the slum types, it will be better for analysis. Next slide. So what we mean by binning is we have two bins, one called uh, a general bin, uh, water supply institutions which are more pervasively used are placed in this bin and there is a slum specific water supply bin which as the name suggests will only have very uh, unique water supply institutions. What we do is we tag each of the water supply institutions uh, so such that these tags can uh, determine some behaviors can, can I help us to identify these water supply institutions. If you see in the example below if a water, if a pipeline based water supply institution uh, is a more generally, is a more pervasive water supply institution, then it will, be, it will have a tag of G. The comma separated list of numbers are the slum types in which it has been found. And then the subscript has numbers of the number of slums of that particular type in which this water supply institution has been found. So for this pipeline water supply institution, it has been found in three slums of type three, six slums of type six, and eight slums of type five. Next slide, please. This is just a decision-making flowchart that I've listed as to how we create the bin, how we create these tags. It is pretty self-explanatory. We have described this extensively in our paper, but essentially this follows a uh, uh, an algorithm where you look into a particular bin, you see if a particular water supply institution is available or not, and uh, you populate it or you move ahead and check another uh, bin. Uh, but if you need any further uh, explanation, I'm willing to come back to this slide later. Next slide, please. So right now for a field practitioner, we have categorized slums and we have also assigned water supply institutions in association with the slum types. Now, how it will be beneficial, why we are doing this, why we are presenting this as a methodology will become much clearer in the next design parts. Next slide. 
The third part of, the, of this methodology is the actual field work. So the field practitioner is actually in the field. He has categorized slums. He has found out all the water supply institutions. What does he do next? First, he uh, makes a list of all the stakeholders uh, who are inside this uh, slum settlement. Next, we have uh, promo proposed that uh, there are five effectivity factors which can actually define whether a water supply institution is effective or not. Those are the quality of water it's providing, the quantity of water it's providing, the cost structure of this water supply institution, the accessibility, the, the ease of access by using uh, the water underlying technology and the reliable, reliability of getting water throughout the year. Next slide. Next, so we know who the stakeholders are and we know how to uh, characterize a water supply institution. Next, what do we do? We need to figure out how many people to interview. For that, we have come up with a way to optimize the sample size. We'll find out the 2% of population for a particular slum, and we'll use Cochrane's formula, as you all know, which is used for uh, determining sample size. And we will use the minimum out of these two for every slum. And there is also a scaling factor, as you see in the denominator in the equation, 1.05 to the power n minus one, which actually scales down the sample size as we have seen that because um, people from a particular financial strata stay in the slum population, interviewing too many people uh, follows the law of diminishing returns. My colleague has worked on the sampling techniques uh, that we have employed in different slums and we have used uh, a snowball sampling technique where we have derived more information as we go in the flow. Next slide. Now we know how many people to uh, interview now, Th then how do we order our interviews? We do this by using the interest versus influence graph where we first look at the high interest and low influence population who are mostly the beneficiaries they don't have much control on how the water supply institution is working, but uh, in order to get a first pass view of how the water supply institution is working, we need to interview them first, followed by the high interest, high influence group, then the low interest, low high influence group, and the low interest, low influence group at the last. Next slide. So once we have created the order of interviews, the next step is to create a master questionnaire and ratio the questions. We are not going to ask all types of questions to every stakeholder. Now we have left, left this at the um, discretion of the field practitioner, but we can go, go through what we have done in our uh, work in later slides. Now, uh, a very important part is the stakeholder in homogeneity graph. This tells us whether all the stakeholders are in sync with one another when they're answering questions about the effectivity of a water supply institution. So Ham, yes. can you speed up a little bit your 30 seconds uh, of your deadline? Oh, okay, okay, sure. The stakeholder homogeneity actually helps us to understand um, whether people are in sync uh, with one another. Next slide. Design part four is an assimilation of all the information uh, from the first three, three slides. It helps us to uh, you know, analyze all the water supply institutions based on uh, the slum type, and it allows us to uh, reuse. Next slide. So as you can see, there are four cases of reuse. If an existing water supply institution is found in a existing slum, there is a high degree of reuse of the recommendations that we can derive. Uh, but it gets low, lesser and lesser as we observe new water supply institutions. So these, these four parts are the basic points of our, uh, of our methodology. Uh, so Ham, could, could yeah. you uh, go to your conclusion, please? Yes, sure. So we have observed, uh, we have use this methodology in three um, slum settlements of India. We have derived a lot of reuse of recommendations of how to improve water supply institutions. And um, we have derived meaningful insights from it as, this, as you increase the scale of this methodology, um, the, re the reuse factor improves. However, there are multitude of factors that we, we have not taken into uh, account because of make, making the methodology more difficult. Uh, that concludes our uh, presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Soham. Uh, thank you also, Priya and Hali. Uh, excellent presentation on a topic which uh, very unfortunately mean uh, 
is there to remain for quite a long time on our agenda, definitely in India, but uh, that's also true in quite many countries around the world. Uh, without further ado, uh, we move to the next presentation and we'll take the question afterwards. Uh, so now we move on to, yes, uh, Anne-Claire Morris, uh, who will talk about pharmaceutical residues. Um, Anne-Claire Morris is a research engineer and postdoctoral fellow at the University Paris-Saclay in France, and she holds a PhD in anthropology of environment, which is unusual in our world, so much, very much needed. And she will present the possibilities to manage pharmaceutical residues at household level to avoid contaminating the environment. Uh, yes, and Claire, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you for these words of uh, introduction. And I would like to present today the outcomes uh, of uh, a study carried out in 2017, 2018. This was a multidisciplinary project focused on pharmaceutical residues in urban uh, wastewater and uh, hospital wastewaters. And, uh, um, we uh, focused on the um, hypothesis uh, of collecting uh, patient excreta to avoid uh, such pollution. So in my presentation, I will uh, uh, follow a classical uh, um, uh, plan. So the first source the number one source uh, of pharmaceuticals in water is excretion. This is true uh, for human pharmaceuticals. Um, the pharmaceutical products will end up in the sewage uh, system and in, um, in the environment. And the scientific community uh, agrees that the um, number one uh, diffuse uh, source uh, of pharmaceutical uh, pollution is mainly uh, households and uh, not uh, uh, hospitals. And this uh, therefore raises a number of uh, questions, uh, um, especially in uh, the fact, uh, in a context where more and more uh, care is transferred from hospital to home, and therefore such research is all the more important. So environmental specialists in France have uh, suggested a collection of excreta for patients that are received treatment at home as a solution to this problem. So the issue here is social acceptance of such a solution, especially the acceptance on the part of health professionals and uh, so the question is how to overcome such uh, barriers. So we carried out a qualitative uh, study uh, at the Belcombe uh, site. So we uh, started with uh, uh, home uh, care, uh, hospital at home services of the Belcombe Hospital. Um, and in France, uh, Hospital at home um, is a technical uh, organization um, that um, could therefore integrate uh, excreta uh, collection. And so we uh, carried out uh, a number of interviews, um, hospital at home, uh, care professionals, and independent nurses and uh, all the other uh, services involved uh, in uh, daycare. Um, we also interviewed a number of key health professionals. Then we chose uh, to uh, um, ask uh, uh, to, to, to interview um, uh, the health service at a, a higher uh, level. So we uh, uh, turned towards um, uh, those uh, who participate, well, that uh, manage uh, health services in France. Uh, and uh, we sent out a questionnaire to students at the French School of Public Health that are either uh, in their initial training phase, but there are also a number of uh, lifelong uh, learning um, programs. 
that the qualitative study showed, uh, and uh, as is the case for other studies uh, for the, uh, the public at large, is that uh, um, um, healthcare professionals are unfamiliar with this issue. But they also they uh, link this issue with uh, the uh, greater concern, which is limiting drug consumption. Uh, limiting drug consumption is linked to, to an economic imperative, but also um, a uh, health um, concern. But at the same time, uh, there's also uh, the streamlining um, of uh, uh, the, their their work. Uh, so the idea of reducing drug, drug consumption to ease their, their work on a daily basis. A second uh, issue that they spontaneously uh, discuss when talking about the pharmaceutical residues um, is the visibility of some drug residues, cytotoxics and radio uh, pharmaceuticals. There are recommendations in these fields uh, already, uh, but uh, according to our survey, um, this is not necessarily taken into account uh, uh, of uh, in the protocols uh, for uh, ho hospital at uh, uh, home care and the uh, handbooks uh, for with health professionals uh, will focus more on the health impact uh, of uh, these measures rather than on the environmental impact. And the, the idea would be to integrate this environmental dimension in a health professionals' concern. Now, if we look at a hypothetical collection of excreta from home, you have to see what already exists in terms of uh, waste management, you have certain difficulties uh, that exist. Uh, one of the specificities of home care within the framework of uh, uh, home care, the people will have very little time for the care at home. They're very solicited uh, by the family members and some carers say that the sorting of pharmaceutical products uh, sort of don't get the same attention as they should be getting at the sort of end of the chain. And then there are procedures uh, in the domestic sphere. Uh, for example, uh, you know, tarification of home nursing, they have to go several visits in the course of the day, uh, rather than concentrating on the many acts during that one visit. And so the, uh, you know, sorting of waste comes into the uh, this category. So the idea, you know, would return towards big uh, categories. Look at the second category can negotiate better with the suppliers of uh, care material, care equipment, uh, to deal with this, uh, that would help uh, the nursing staff who will, of course, still have to do some sorting. Now, in terms of uh, medicinal residues or non-use medicines, and uh, the, in the same plus, you have the superimposition of different sorting. For, you've got the domestic uh, sorting rules, uh, sorting in the, the you know, a freelance exercise of nursing and uh, other domestic uh, waste rules. Now, if we were to come closer to the question of the collection of excreta, you can actually have a look at what is already happening in terms of uh, uh, waste management, body waste management. You've got uh, hygiene care, uh, this is less and less the case. Uh, there's a slipping of uh, tasks where the freelance nurse will uh, assist the doctor but take on the role of some of uh, some of the roles of the doctor do the home visit and this uh, uh, means that the nurse is you know feels more valorizing to do more technical work and uh, you have uh, 
those workers who are more sort of qualified to take care of uh, uh, such a sorting. There's already procedures of excreta collection from homes, but uh, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. This leads certain carers to believe that the patients uh, were okay for collection procedure because they do this in the, uh, you know, objective of a diagnosis. But we can question the real driving force uh, of a more environmental objective. And generally speaking, we have skeptical attitudes and reticence on the part of the carers for different reasons, namely in terms of the human involvement that this would engender and the, the relationship with the patient and the carer. Because talking about collection of excreta to uh, deal with the medicinal residue and that's a medicinal, uh, you know, uh, elements that are contained in the excreta. It's already very difficult to uh, talk about, uh, you know, the risk of infection in the excreta because uh, you can be talking about somebody very uh, ill and the individual weight that the collection of excreta would actually represent would be far too much as compared to the collective uh, uh, load and that the uh, effect it would have on the environment. Health uh, professional managers, uh, there's a lack of knowledge uh, with regard to the question of uh, medicinal residue. For example, if we were to take uh, the question of sources, all the respondents, but the biggest source identified as being important or major is that of non-use medicines, which are thrown, thrown down the sink or flushed down. In um, today, the major problem is the excreta of patients. Similarly, when you ask them, according to them, what are the most relevant options to avoid having such residues in the water, these professionals uh, first and foremost mention solutions linked to the unused pharmaceuticals. Raising the question of the interventions with regard to non-used uh, medicines and residue of medicine in water, would it not be better to put an articulation of these problems and their specificities? Next slide. Finally, when you are looking at the predictors uh, with regard to patient excreta collection, you see that the main predictor the perception of their own capacity is uh, her prof professional position of uh, control uh, perceived or uh, you know direct or indirect more than the perception of a risk of a presence or sociodemographic uh, factors and when you want to find out who has a greater control in their own jobs you realize that you're talking about um, hospital directors medical social uh, healthcare but hospital engineers for example i feel uh, less involved or are less controlled and i think this has to be taken into account in the way in which we will deal with uh, in uh, the information sharing, deal with them in order not to sort of, you know, forget to involve them. The main link, uh, pharmaceutical residuals and water, how, you know, in many ways invisible to health workers for different reasons. Next slide, please because of a lack of integration of environmental objectives in healthcare objects and contexts, and potentially as a lack of knowledge, but also the difficulties for health professionals to introduce environmental perspectives in patients and caregivers' relationships. And uh, you have to 
recognize a certain amount of reluctance to the options proposed by environmental scientists and stakeholders of collecting patient excreta. Next slide, please. And in conclusion, I would say that we are joining up with other observations of other speakers. Public health and environmental concerns regarding pharmaceutical residuals should be reconsidered uh, together. So I'd like to thank all the respondents to these uh, surveys and the professionals who actually allowed us to make them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, and Claire, excellent presentation. Um, I mean, crosses many things I've heard elsewhere, such as the the OECD has provided views as to best manage the pollution from uh, um, pharmaceutical residues, and the European Union is taking action on that, uh, pretty much along the line which you indicated. Uh, and thank you for holding to the time. Um, so we switch to the last presentation of this section. Um, which do, will be dealing with flood resilient solution in self-built housing in dry Nigeria. Uh, so I introduce uh, Baboshi Kenopurdum, uh, who is a sustainability professional and lead green associate. She is a PhD candidate in the architecture, engineering, construction management program at Carnegie Mellon University. And she was awarded in 2020 the EDF Climate Corp Business Case Award for her research with the New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Uh, but her presentation today deals with the screening of solutions uh, to protect households from floodings in dry Nigeria. With that, Babushi, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, welcome everyone, and thank you for logging to the session. Today I'll be presenting my and my co author's research on the implications of physical and technical conditions on flood resilience in self-built housing in tropical Nigeria. Um, this slide's not showing for me, sorry. So, but this presentation will briefly describe the significance of the research, the status quo and gaps and practice and how surveys were used to address these gaps. But before I dive in, I wanna ask everybody, how often do you see news reports about floods or flood events? Um, in Africa, South America, South Asia, or small island development states such as the Caribbean, probably every few weeks, right? And that's because these flood events occur frequently in urban areas across tropical rainforest, monsoon, and savanna climatic regions in the global south. This year alone, the emergency events database reported that over 90 floods have occurred. Next slide, please. Nigeria that has primarily monsoon and savanna climates, it's one of the countries vulnerable to floods, especially in its two mega cities in Lagos and Potaka. Um, Lagos is in the southwest of Nigeria and Potaka is in the Niger Delta region. Next slide, please. So when these slides occur every year, thousands of lives are lost, thousands of people are displaced, and there's an increased occurrence of water and vector-borne diseases such as cholera and malaria which can be especially fatal for the elderly or young children. In addition to these, there's millions of dollars lost in property damages and expenses related to redevelopment costs of damaged homes and replacement of property. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the burden of these damages and loss of property is on households who build homes themselves through a self-build process um, as they bear the significant redevelopment costs. Next slide, please. So why are they vulnerable? Um, there's a myriad of factors that increase their vulnerability to floods um, in Nigeria beyond the climate. The conditions of their built environment and natural environment, which includes poor urban drainage, um, infrastructure, unreliable power supply, unplanned land use, and the topography of an individual's um, site exposes them to floods. And when you add sensitivity factors, such as low income, um, because of high poverty rates in the country, limited education and conflict, the ability of urban dwellers to respond effectively to climate stress, um, such as floods, diminishes. Next slide, please. So to reduce these significant costs now and in the future for urban dwellers in Nigeria, it's important to, one, access vulnerability, evaluate risk, and three, and most especially, utilize design solutions that are resilient to floods and flood risks. Um, next slide, please. There are two main approaches for resilience in Nigerian regions just like Nigeria. 
The first is top down, which is governmental and policy focused, and the second is bottom up, which is from the household level. However, literature has shown that top down approaches such as levies, um, drainage infrastructure and emergency services, um, though effective on a large scale, are not effective for day to day resilience, especially for um, the urban poor who reside in informal settlements and have limited access to utilities and infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. On the other hand, though um, through an extensive literature review, there is evidence that bottom-up solutions, such as um, raising entry points and building house on pilotes or wooden stilts, um, are heavily used at the household level, and they address the day-to-day -day needs of households and the urban poor. And these are all used as a primary form of resilience by households to complement and fill the gaps that top-down solutions um, have. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, although there's a myriad of design solutions in literature, there's no source informing self-builders on how to properly and effectively choose and implement these flawed um, bottom-up design solutions. Research has shown that design solutions are used in the wrong context. Um, this leads to the failure of the design solution or short-term success. And this is because self-builders are not fully aware about how their natural and built environments contribute to the effectiveness of these design solutions. This occurs um, mainly because self-builders primarily learn from their informal, um, learn informally from their families, friends, or communities to so that sphere of influence. And the limited knowledge of the complex environments within that sphere of influence at the end of the day ends up increasing the vulnerabilities of populations such as the elderly, um, people with disabilities, and children to urban flooding in the long term. Next slide, please. So to fill this gap, um, this research investigated why design solutions through, though effective in one context, may fail in another. So this past summer, an open-ended um, pilot survey was dis distributed to households in tropical um, global south countries. Paper and online formats were utilized and um, questions were asked in four main areas of inquiry. So the first was the socioeconomic profile, which is used to determine if there are trends between um, conditions such as income and education and the long-term effectiveness of a design solution. The second and third include the physical and technical conditions of the neighborhood in site. And the last section um, asks participants to highlight the design solutions they've utilized to prevent flood damage and the outcomes of using um, those solutions. Next slide, please. So um, descriptive statistics was used to determine associations between physical and technical indicators of sites and neighborhoods and long-term success of design solutions. Next slide. Physical conditions are described as naturally occurring landforms that are either permanent or temporary. Next slide. While the technical conditions are human-made and because they're human-made, they are considered temporary features and can always shift in relation to an individual site. Um, next slide. So from the pilot survey, 28 responses were used. This 28 was selected after excluding responses that were partially complete and were from respondents in countries within the global south, such as Canada and the United States. As an overview, um, majority of the responses were from the city of Port Harcourt in the south of Nigeria, and which is a low elevation coastal zone. And majority of the respondents were within the ages of 25 to 30, um, 34 years old. Next slide, please. Participants were asked to rate how successful each outcome was on a scale of um, very successful to unknown. Very successful meant that the solution was successful every time and over a long period of time. Well, um, unknown meant the solution was, the outcome of the solution was either hard to tell or it wasn't noticed. Strategies such as sand filling were reported as very successful by all respondents that utilized it. While findings revealed that there are multiple outcomes when planted trees, damp proof membrane, raised entry points, and dug a dish to transport water were used. So this corresponds with literature that reported that outcomes did fluctuate depending on the context of um, households or users. So because of this fluctuation in the outcomes of design solutions, they were for this for the, um, highlighted design solutions were further analyzed to determine the physical and technical conditions that were associated with the very successful outcomes. Next slide, please. 
So looking at tree planting, um, the key findings indicated that it was effective for flood resilience when flood levels were up to four feet and when used in conjunction with cisterns and flood walls or ditches. Tree planting was also reported as effective by survey respondents who live in low density neighborhoods that had vegetation in their neighborhoods. When using tree planting as a resilient design solution, um, a lot of respondents didn't consider factors that may maladapted or other design solutions such as high winds. And um, this is also very, this is also frequently um, not considered by self builders. Next slide, please. So using damp proof membranes were also reported to be effective for flood levels up to four feet when used with other design solutions. However, they were effective for both low and medium density neighbor, um, neighborhoods unlike the tree planting. Vegetation also contributed to long-term successful outcomes of the design solutions. Next slide, please. When raised entry points were used alone, um, they were only effective for preventing flood damage up to 0.9 feet and were only effective when used on sloping and flat sites. It was effective for households in both low and medium um, density neighborhoods and an important design consideration that um, also households didn't consider was that the height of the design solution should dictate the height of the raised entry point. So um, based on prior floods that should um, dictate what height the raised entry point should be. Ideally, um, it should be about a foot and a half above the expected flood levels. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, the use of um, ditches was effective for flood levels up to four feet when used in um, tandem with tree planting. However, high density um, neighborhoods reduced the effectiveness of this design solution, especially when the sites were close to coastal fronts or marshlands. Next slide, please. So the findings from the pilot survey pro, um, provided a clear direction of how physical and technical conditions, which may be influenced by socioeconomic factors, affect the long-term success of design solutions. A larger survey was consequently conducted and there's been over 150 um, responses so far, and this will be open for a few more weeks to see how much more um, responses we can get. This large survey is also focusing on if the presence and conditions of drainage infrastructure is associated with outcomes as findings from the preliminary, um, preliminary survey indicated that the drainage in neighborhoods do not have an effect. Um, and at this juncture, I would like to uh, mention once more how maladaptation, maladaptation is not considered at the forefront of these design solutions um, at both the household or city level and it should be. And, um, just want to thank everyone again for listening in. Thank you so much, uh, Babushi. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, I think we are very fortunate this afternoon because we had uh, three extremely good presentation. What strikes me is that um, um, you three or four uh, are really trying to bridge the gap be between uh, was that long-term intentions and very short-term concerns that uh, either the patients or the population out in the ground, I mean, uh, suffer from in terms of not having access to potable water or either being uh, very sensitive to floodings of all sorts. I mean, and you're trying to bridge the gap, which ultimately, I mean, owes a lot to improving the governance overall um, to ensure that everyone, I mean, can access water, is uh, defended against floods and uh, ultimately, uh, how can I say that, is well advised in terms of how to manage uh, the uh, pharmaceutical uh, residues. Um, with that, uh, I don't want to speak too much. Uh, we have a good 10 minutes to take questions from the floor. Um, turning towards uh, the colleagues at UNES UNESCO. Um, uh, we have one question uh, to Bobushi. Uh, how has the urban flooding affected Nigeria and its drainage condition incorporated with green infrastructure in Nigeria? I don't know from who it comes, but that's a question to you, Babushi, if you may take this one. Um, so um, as kind of mentioned in the PowerPoint and in the paper, there is significant destruction of homes yearly. Um, there's about maybe three to four major floods that kind of happen due to the fact that the Niger, um, the river Nigers and Delta are there. And so um, households in the southern part and southwestern part of Nigeria is most especially affected, especially when you have um, high density cities like Lagos with um, 
poor urban planning and increased hard surfaces. So there is minimal drainage systems. And when they are, they're not in the best condition, they're either clogged, which was why we asked that in the survey. Um, however, based on responses from you know, respondents, drainage didn't seem to really affect the outcome of their design solution. So that's something we'll see in the future um, surveys that we're doing. But in terms of green infrastructure, there are, um, so they're not planned out as like, they're not planned out like low impact developments like you see in other parts of like the world, like in America. They are more so tree planting and um, a little bit of like permeable pavements. However, they're not focused primarily being like green infrastructure um, systems like bioswales or rain gardens. So they do exist just in terms of like natural veg uh, vegetation, but not structured to be infrastructure. I know that answered. Okay, excellent. Uh, I would then turn towards uh, Anne Claire. Um, uh, interesting presentation indeed, uh, by many regards, uh, very clear. Uh, what about the sensitivity of the physicians I and mean, the, the medical doctors? I mean, uh, do they show any awareness of the need to, that there is an issue with the pharmaceutical residues uh, when you have in the environment? Please. Uh, in our study, we do not have quantitative elements. Uh, uh, in the qualitative uh, study, it seemed that they were not aware, uh, more aware than uh, paramedical uh, uh, staff uh, on the basis of the elements uh, that were shown. Uh, you have this trend uh, from the quantitative uh, study point of view, the sample was small, uh, but uh, what emerged was uh, the perception of health risk and uh, uh, medical professionals uh, uh, did not think that uh, it was important compared to other professionals, even though uh, there is no demonstration for environmental uh, risk uh, and Thank you so much, risk Claire, in very the literature. Clear answer, um, which I mean, um, real, I mean, is very much linked to the current state of at least the euro on the pharmaceuticals, which basically uh, is built on the on the premises that uh, the defense of public health is paramount, and uh, there is not much uh, care for the environment at this stage, although it is changing or due to change in the near future. Um, I would now like to turn back to our colleagues from India um, uh, about this um, survey about water access in the slums. Um, something that struck me is that uh, you start with the, um, uh, in a way, with the assumption that uh, water access, in a way, is driven by your tra two, two criteria of climate and population. So these, I mean, I mean, seems to be actually at the tip of, of your segmentation. And uh, why is that? And ultimately, does that initial categorization explain in a way whether people ultimately have access to, I mean, a decent level of uh, drinking water or not? Or is this just because for administrative reasons, uh, these criteria impose themselves or uh, Again, exposed, do they um, do they show that there is strong difference according to that first categorization? Over to you, either Soham or Priyang Halagi. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the two cat categories that we decided were very closely connected to the water resources of a region. Uh, climate was uh, is as you know is very uh, important where while we figure out the water reserves. And the population uh, determines uh, whether uh, you know water can be the amount of water that is there can be equally distributed or not. There are other factors that we have we, we have thought about. For example, the landscape. Some uh, informal settlements are in uh, you know hilly landscapes. Uh, it's not connected to the climate, but just hilly landscapes, and that uh, affects the accessibility of water resources. But if we increase the number of uh, categories. Uh, it just increases the you know the number of categories. We, now we have nine. It can increase uh, manyfold. One we add one, once we add one more uh, identifier. Uh, 
And that defeats the purpose of a methodology. We are trying to look at slums uh, based on the slum type and not individual uh, slum analysis. Um, if, that, if that blows up out of proportion, it's going to be very difficult for a field practitioner to handle. Uh, therefore, we looked at the most the two most relevant factors that affect the water supply reserves. Of course, it can be extended out, but at, at, and we have to make a weighing a pros versus cons as to which one we use uh, uh, to have a very fast and quickly usable methodology. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any uh, question from the floor? Otherwise, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, it seems that your presentation were quite clear. Uh, nothing pops up. So um, I'm going to wrap up uh, without further ado. Uh, first, thanking you. I mean, uh, you young people are doing a tremendous job in terms of uh, finding solutions or analyzing uh, what solutions, uh, I mean, are popping up and possibly could be used uh, again to develop access that for you guys in India or uh, to protect better the populations against floodings or to protect the population against uh, environmental damages, uh, which are now being described more and more uh, with the pharmaceutical residues. Uh, there would be um, um, a high number of questions, I mean, to further uh, refine and, and put these um, uh, first uh, thoughts in terms of improvement into action. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, you're there for probably one or two generations, so you have plenty, I mean, I, I talk to the authors, you'll have plenty of time to, I mean, look uh, how they land on the ground and what, uh, what change they can provide and the improvement they can provide to the population. So again, uh, uh, thank you so much for your brilliant presentations, which were quite clear for the three of you, four of you, sorry again. Thank you so much, and I uh, hand over the floor to the organizers. Have a good day. Chers auditeurs, merci pour votre participation et nous vous attendons avec plaisir demain à 13h. Thank you for your participation. We will be expecting you tomorrow at 1 uh, for this uh, for two uh, sessions on water megacities and global change. Thank you for uh, joining us.